Well, hello from the nest of the eagle. Uh, often in God's presence, one doesn't feel too much like an eagle. I'm experiencing really lovely stuff being leveled. There's a lovely phrase an old preacher used to use, ruined for the natural. When you see the eternal, um, I'll just give you the scripture promise uh, and then go on to something. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to, to chapter 5, verse 8. I'm not going to read that. I'm just going to read the, the one verse, chapter 4, verse 17. But that passage I mentioned from... Uh, 416 to 5 verse 8 is medicine and food but the one verse I'm going to read you verse 17 of 4 for our light affliction which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory and it goes on to say, as we look at those things which are not seen, but the things which are not seen are eternal, but the things which are seen are temporary. But God is working a far greater, exceeding glory. The verse that spoke to that verse spoke to me that whatever He's doing, and we're collaborating with him, cooperating with him, is to work in us something of eternity. And that whole passage I mentioned is, is talking about the reality of us, us being prepared for eternity. So it's, it's a good vision to have. Now, the subject matter, which I can't read uh, hardly any of, obviously, but I've been writing, it's virtually a book, <laughs> Deliverance Through the Cross. We'll talk about that. That's the main just, I want to just give you some jewels. Um, but I just scribbled this onto the end of the unfinished book. Because this, we're going to look at some stuff very briefly, very uh, short uh, video. And this last bit is kind of key into how we view tough stuff that I, you know, sometimes bring and other people bring probably. How do we view it? And I'll, I'll begin here. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's, that's Jesus preaching a sermon on the mount. It's an awesome leveling sermon. And that one sentence taken out of that blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God and I've said who can view God with crystal clear vision who has an antenna with no interference for he shall see God as he really is God's word in its entirety is God's revelation to man but the Pharisee will twist that truth. The Pharisee will not see God as he is. Whatever flaw or speck is in our eye will contaminate our vision of God. Only the pure in heart shall see God. There's a lovely uh, illustration Jesus used. He used it in different places, sometimes relating to money. But here he says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But when your eye is bad, your, your body also will be full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Now that's a beautiful uh, a couple of verses, Luke 11, 34, 36, there's a sermon in that. So it's a bit much to chuck that in, but if you stop and re-listen to that, Jesus is talking about if, if your eye 
is, again, it's like pure, clear, crystal clear, then your whole, everything you look at will be clear. That's the gist of it. And I'll move swiftly on just to conclude this bit. There are many hard and tough truths in the Bible, but there are also glimpses into the loveliness of God, the beauty of God. So which one is he? Which one is God? There is a wrath of God, the judgment of God, but there is a mercy of God which is new every morning. There is a love of God which he has shown us in giving us his son to die for us. His son who came to seek and save the lost, who leaves the 99 sheep to search for the lost one, then puts it over his shoulders and rejoices and throws a party. So which one is God? Wrath, judgment, or the shepherd looking for the lost sheep who gave, and the father who gave his son to die for us? And I've said, the answer as far as we are concerned is that we must work to have a pure heart to see him as he really is. The pure in heart shall see God. It is an ongoing quest because our vision gets marred along the way. And we have seasons when we're not seeing God clearly. Uh, I'll, before I just conclude with this introduction into deliverance through the cross, I will just say that I was ruined the other day in a worship time with others and it was their work. I didn't put it together, so it was all credit to them. But in the middle of that, I was reduced to a weeping wreck because later I described it to myself as I thought what I saw is I saw the beauty of God. Just a glimpse. There's a lovely psalm that says, all my days I will dwell in the house of God to behold the beauty of God and to inquire in his tabernacle. But that middle verse, to behold the beauty of God. I saw a glimpse of the beauty of God and I was reduced to a weeping mess. And in that moment I thought, if only the world could see that God whom I just glimpsed the very fringes of a glimpse of the beauty of the love of God. The world would run to that Jesus. This is again why I've talked about God looking for shepherds after his own heart. And yet, I will add and say, there are some tough things. And, and there are some truths that we don't get. There's this beauty of God and if we were cleaned up and pure in our vision, maybe we could spend more time just beholding the beauty of God. But we're in it for the community. We're in it for to bring others into freedom and deliverance. So I talk about, this is surely an introduction. I have got so much editing to do. I've got a half a book there. And... Deliverance through the cross. I'll just read this bit and then uh, go around a few bits. And, I, and I'll say this. The greatest news you will ever know, and it is that great news of God sending his son into this world, but do we grasp it, this good news, in its entirety? The great news is that there is absolutely nothing redeemable in the fallen nature of Adam. <laughs> you can see how it's sort of two-edged. That sounds tough. Nothing redeemable in the fallen nature of Adam. At first you might think this contradicts all that we have said of Jesus dying to redeem us. But let us look again and we shall see that Jesus didn't come to fix the fallen nature of Adam, but to provide a way whereby Adam might have that nature put to death. That's where the tough truth comes in. 
Jesus provided a way. There was no way without this. We know from the deepest study that even all the sacrifices of the Old Testament were accredited really upon the cross of Jesus. So all that they enjoyed with the sacrifices was, was placed really upon Jesus dying once for all in the middle of time at the exact time on the cross. So God's sentence and only cure for the fallen nature of Adam was to put it in its entirety to death. The law could not do it. And there's a lovely verse, Romans 8, 3, what the law could not do in that, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. It is because Jesus took upon himself the likeness of sinful flesh that we could literally enter and become one with him and thereby be taken with him to death on the cross. We could not die to that fallen nature without his being made sin for us. And I'll just put this in bracket to make it clear. Although Jesus took upon him what the scripture says is the likeness of sinful flesh, there is no way that that means he entered into the deeds of that sinful flesh. Jesus was and is without sin, period. Bible, conclude, bracket, shut. If God's verdict and sentence upon the fallen nature of Adam is to put it to death, can you see how absurd and deluded we can be in trying to present that nature to God? It reminds me of the offering of Cain, first book of the Bible. Cain offered something to God. It was rejected. Uh, Abel offered the fr fruit, first fruit of uh, his flock. Cain offered the working of his flesh in the soil, which had been cursed. Abel, Abel offered the first fruits of the flock, of the, his sheep. Abel's offering was accepted by God. Cain's offering was rejected, and Cain ended up killing Abel. It persecutes the flesh, persecutes the spirit. That's going off on one. But... That can make you wonder when you first read that in the Bible. What on earth is this distinction? Rejecting Cain, then Cain kills Abel. God, you should have accepted him. You know, we could ask silly questions like that. But not wishing to go off on there. God's verdict and sentence upon the fallen nature of Adam was he condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus said that has to die, it cannot be fixed. Now, the book, <laughs> I don't mean it to be a book, but the gist of deliverance through the cross is that our old can be struck off, finished with on the cross. There is freedom because we were crucified with Christ. I was nailed to a tree with Jesus and therefore I'm free. Nothing to defend, no one to accuse. I am crucified, dead to sin. Now there's so much I wrote, obviously I can't go into it. There is that freedom of the old nature still at work. The young lady who judged her father is still, the poison is still coming to the surface. And this is where the freedom and release of the old is brought to death on the cross. The shame, the guilt of deeds we have done, it is truly dealt with. It's not covering up. It's put to death, and therefore we experience freedom. So although this is an introduction, maybe I should uh, <laughs> do another message one day um, and focus on the material, because it is... It is in acknowledging, confessing, placing that prayerfully with others around us maybe, that we can truly know 
but hey, that has been dealt with. And we forgive those who have sinned against us. We forgive ourselves. We see that we were nailed to the cross with Jesus. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The pure in heart will see God. So all these things are going to be come together in setting us free as our vision has purified. God gave me a glimpse of his beauty and my heart has been very free since. So there are many believers, there are many non-believers who are crushed and hurting and wounded and carrying stuff, wondering why poison attitudes still spring to the surface when they gave their life to Jesus. Why is that? Is there something wrong with me, they say? And this is why the message of deliverance through the cross needs to be brought very clearly. And there are some principles. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. If we are judging out of pain and trauma and sin against us, if we're judging others in the now, and because of some sin against us by someone else, nothing to do with today, if we're, we've still got that bitterness that spring, springs out and strikes out and hurts others out of the poison of our own heart, the disappointment of our own heart, then I want you to know there is true deliverance through the cross. There is true freedom from the old part of it is to know that I, what I said, there is no, no th nothing fixable redeemable in the fallen nature of Adam. It needs to be put to death. Many, many believers are trying to hold it all together, trying to fix the flesh. The Pharisee is trying to do the works of God so that he might be accepted. All this is not the gospel of being buried with Christ in baptism and raised to the newness of life. You can see how deep this message is and what, what was a sh message ended up half a book. I don't know how, uh, how, how much, I hope I just chucked this out to uh, encourage you to believe again for a fresh start to seeing the beauty of God, to, to letting go of all of the old, it is possible, it is available, it is your inheritance to have utter, complete freedom and to see God as he is, to see the love of God. Is he the God of wrath or God of judgment? He, he's all of those things. This is where some of the softer messages want to, they're so desperate to convey to you the love of God that they are reluctant to read the heavy. But if we keep pursuing God face to face, then we will see the pain of this love that is being rejected and refused even more painfully because we see how much God loves even those who are fighting him, rejecting him, hating him, and yet he loves. So it all fits together and we're ambassadors of reconciliation. So we've got to wear the tough and, and it, it forms the message. Jesus didn't close his eyes and shut his ears from the holiness of God and the, 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 the coming day of God to, in order to pr win the prostitute, to gather the sinners about him who flocked to him to be healed, to just hear him, to just touch his garments and be healed. They flocked to him because he revealed the beauty of God. He revealed it in his flesh. The truth was manifest. The beauty of God was seen out of the pores of his skin, out of every, every, uh, what's that beautiful artistic word? Every uh, glimpse of, of his communication 
was the beauty of God revealed. And it says the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors were keen to hear him because they'd never seen the love of God so pure. All I'd heard is the law and the wrath of God without any love, without any explanation of the fullness of God. So although I've gone round about and just chucked it out, I promise you there is a cross where you can be free of sin, of shame, of judgment. And if the, we are to believe the Bible, Jesus took our sicknesses, our infirmities. He was bruised. He took our sorrows, our sufferings, our grief. He took that on the cross so that we can know the blessedness, the freedom, the acceptance, the favor, the blessing of God. You see, so it's in embracing the tough thorns of this cross, the message of the cross, that we experience true freedom and deliverance through the cross of Jesus Christ, who loves you, who searches for you as a sheep that's gone astray. He's looking to bring you home, bring you in. So turn again and seek him. Seek to have your eyes clean so that you can see God as he truly is, the beauty of God. May God bless you. Amen.